thanks, Gary. Right, morning, everyone. Um, it's so lovely to see some very familiar names um, on the on the attendance list. Um, oh, hold on. Start my video. Wait a minute. Right. Okay, so I'm talking to you today in my role as chair of the SAMES committee, and I, I'll explain a bit later what the whole acronym of SAMESG actually stands for. But SAMESG is a guideline that supports the SAMREC code, the SAMVAL code, the SAMAL code, um, which I trust everyone on this call is familiar with. You've either come from a geological background or you doing mine planning, metallurgy, you've been involved in evaluating the viability of a mine at some point in your career. And the SAMES guideline is, has been written to support application of the various SAM codes in determining viability of, of mining projects. Um, I've been chair of the committee for almost two years now. The SAMES was actually launched in 2014. Um, and yeah, the committee's gone through various phases, but we one of the, the accolades uh, that the SAMES guideline received was last year in October, we received a reward, an award from the United Nations. Um, their International um, Society of Accounting and Reporting uh, gave us an award for the, the SAMES guideline for its contribution to integrating the sustainable development goals into the sustainability reports of reporting entities. Um, so that was really a, a high point for all of us. So my talk today is aimed at both geologists as well as professionals who are involved in competent persons reports um, and who perhaps may be ESG specialists who provide that, that input. So just as an overview and for those um, who are geologists, you guys will be seeing this diagram in your sleep, but for those of us who, who aren't or at least in my case no longer a practicing geologist, um, the way that you determine the viability of a mine starts really from the earliest phases where we undertaking exploration project, you get exploration results, which tells you that there's something in the ground that's vaguely uh, worth looking at further. Um, and you then classify that, those results as either mineral resources or mineral reserves. In classifying as, uh, your mineral resources, there are three levels, indica inferred, indicated, and measured. And depending on your level of understanding of it, the scientific modeling and evaluation work that's been done, that'll determine which, which category you classify the resources as. You then can convert mineral resources to mineral reserves. And in doing so, we apply modifying factors. And depending on your level of confidence in the modifying factors, you either come to probable or crude preserves. Now, modifying factors in the SAMRE code are defined as considerations that are used to convert resources to reserves and include a range of uh, inputs and disciplines from mining to processing infrastructure, economic, legal, as well as our ESG factors. So SAMESG, the official name for SAMESG is the South African Guideline for the Reporting of Environmental, Social and Governance Parameters within the solid minerals and oil and gas industries. And this guideline basically supports application of the SAMREC code in understanding what these ESG modifying factors might be and how to um, then classify your mineral resources and mineral reserves as a result of such modifying factors. In determining whether or not we actually have a mineral resource, you need to look at a concept which is called the reasonable prospects for eventual economic extraction. And competent persons, again, are very familiar with this term. And the CP has quite a lot of latitude to contemplate what they would find to be eventual economic extraction. And this is where interaction with an ESG professional would be valuable in determining your RPEEE to, to figure out if you actually have a mineral resource um, because various sensitive receptors, again, I'll go into those a bit later, but sensitive receptors can influence whether or not there is, you're going to be able to access what's in the ground um, and whether if there actually is an eventual uh, chance of economic extraction. 
So the RPEEE needs to be demonstrated through considering the potential viability of the mineral resource. That consideration should include an assessment of the geological as well as modifying factors, which could influence the RPEEE. When we determining RPEEE, it should be based on principles of reasonable, reasonableness, uh, as well as being justifiable and defendable. And all of these principles are left up to the, the competent person to apply. Uh, and in the case of, of ESG, with the assistance of a person who understands the, the ESG considerations. So when you converting your resources to reserves, this is where we apply the modifying factors. They need to be applied because they can influence the economic viability of a mine. If you're taking something like mine planning, depth of the resource, if you're looking at technology required to potentially process the, the rocks once they come out of the ground, if it's brand new technology, unproven, very expensive, it'll influence the economic viability of the mine. Likewise, ESG factors can influence mining uh, viability and should be considered from the earliest opportunity. If we have a lot of confidence in what the, the modifying factor is, how it potentially is going to impact on the project, that can be results in your, your resources being converted to proved reserves. If we've got reasonable confidence, then you'll probably, um, excuse the pun, convert those to probable reserves. However, there is also a provision that if we just have no confidence in how these ESG modifying factors are going to play out and influence our project, then you actually don't have to convert reserves to resources. Again, a lot of pressure on the, on the CP to do all of this, but SAMREC does provide for you to forego de declaring reserves if there's very little confidence or there's very high risk attached to any of the ESG modifying factors. So just some examples and if you guys are putting comments on the chat, uh, you may want to, to post some answers or you may want to give opinions on these examples and it's just random hypothetical examples to, to illustrate the points that I'm trying to make and, and to give you guys some food for thought. Um, if we take, for example, a potential greenfield site, we've done some remote sensing and we think that there's something in the ground here that's worth exploring further. There's a community located in this area. There's a whole lot of rivers that we need to be worried about. And on the northern part of the project area is the Endangered Species National Park. And all of these are things that the SAMES guideline asks you to look at and to think about. So some questions for thought is, should you try and explore in the Endangered Species National Park? Now, depending on which country um, this project's located in, there could be different legal requirements around that. Certainly in the South African context, uh, if you're in a national park, you may not undertake mining or exploration activities um, unless there's approval from the, the Environmental Affairs and as well as from the DMR. Uh, the next question is, if you are allowed to undertake various field work, what would you, how would you treat the reserves under the areas of the community within the nature reserve, underneath and adjacent to the rivers? How would you consider those in your, your declared mineral resource? And additionally, what, how would you classify your mineral reserves uh, in the sensitive receptors areas based on these ESG modifying factors? Again, there's a whole lot of background stuff in terms of understanding the geology, but this is purely just from an ESG perspective. If we take, for example, um, an existing mine, uh, there may be some rehab backlog that, is, it, it, that needs to be addressed. There's some sinkholes. There's a river that's been impacted by mining operations. In the, the annual CPR that's developed for existing mines, we need to look at our cutoff grade to, to influence the determination of our mineral reserves. And so some things to consider is, how do we cost things like the pollution of the river, the back of the sinkholes, into determining our cutoff grade um, and the viability of that mine? And obviously being aware that all of those liabilities need to be legally addressed in terms of our um, environmental approvals, the EIA, water use license, et cetera. So where does SAMES come into all of this and how, what a SAMES looks like? Basically, as I've said earlier, it 
highlights the, the ESG modifying factors, which can influence our RPEEE. The, the principles of SAMESC are aligned to the 2016 codes, the SAMREC SAMVAL codes, uh, and it was launched with the 2016 code. So I think it went live on the website at the beginning of 2017. And it's supplementary guidance to assist CPs in understanding how these ESG aspects should be considered uh, in their resource and reserve determinations. There are nine components of the SAMES guideline and they focus on material ESG modifying factors. So SAMES asks of the competent person together with a delegated uh, technical specialist to consider what is material for that particular site. So if you've got an existing mine, it's SAMESG isn't really worried about the, the multiple two liter oil spills that happen on an hourly basis on various mines around the country, but it's really worrying about what are the material factors. So is there a rehab backlog? Is there a community issue that could potentially impact the viability of the mine? Because those are the things that ultimately, for example, when you do a due diligence process, those are the big and scary things that, that come up that can influence the, the viability of a mine. So SAMESC's nine um, requirements apply across all phases of the SAMREC code from exploration results, mineral resources, and mineral reserves, with the requirement that each of these um, nine components be elaborated on in more detail as you move through the process of better understanding the mineral deposit. So from an exploration phase, there would be a lot of desktop research, for example, but by the time you're declaring mineral reserves, you've typically had teams on the ground for a while. You understand the sensitive receptors in the area, you understand the community issues, you understand the environmental considerations, um, and you should be having a lot more detail in terms of what those, those material issues are likely to be. Also, by the time you get to mineral reserves, you've probably done your full-scale EIA process, potentially your water use license applications, and you have a good understanding of what these ESG considerations are likely to be for that particular project. We've taken the SAMREC guideline and we've additionally input the requirements into table one of SAMREC. Uh, this is currently in progress. We started this at the beginning of the year. Um, with wonderful support uh, from, from Tanya Marshall as the head of the SSC, as well as Ken Lomberg from SAMREC. Um, and so it'll be published later this year, but it's the, the red text here just indicates how the, the guidance will be reflected in table one. So that, because we know a lot of competent persons when they're actually preparing their reports, they, they sort of use table one as a checklist. So having the SAMREC group um, guidance incorporated into table one, we hope will make it easier for CPs to apply SAMESC when they're preparing their reports. The CP obviously has overall responsibility for the mineral resources and mineral reserves that are declared in the report. And SAMESC then calls for input from technical specialists. So the, the CP is a, a very strict definition of what the CP is. They have competency requirements. A technical specialist we've also defined in terms of a person who has expertise in either ESG matters um, and is able to advise the, the, the CP. Uh, when I was working for a mining company, I was often called in by CPs who were preparing their, their um, CP reports and asked to provide input on the environmental risks for particular projects. And so that's the kind of interaction that SAMESC is, is calling for. Um, we know that for junior mining companies, you don't have a, a range of resources on standby to provide a lot of input, but you do have to go through a legal process of getting, uh, a, whether it's a basic assessment for prospecting or a full-scale environmental impact assessment, those studies will flag to you what the, the ESG, um, well, certainly the environmental and social issues that are likely to be material and so those the outputs of those processes should then be used uh, in the absence of a dedicated technical specialist on site. Obviously the CP must make sure that the contributions from these specialists are of a suitable quality that helps inform decision making in the, in the CP report and that all contributors sign off to it. Um, SAMREC notes that 
estimations of mineral resources could be a team effort, um, but when you get to, to declaring mineral reserves, you have to have a team involved because there's a range of technical disciplines that need to have input into declaring mineral reserves. Samrek also asks for the, the team who are involved in the, the CP reports to actually do a site visit, um, which is critically important because from an ESG perspective, a lot of these factors are going to be very obvious once you get your feet on the ground. You can see where there's a river, you can see where there's a community located close by. Um, you'll see if there's a fence indicating that there's a national park on, on, on one side of the, the property. So that site visit is invaluable from a, a SAMES perspective. So really, in summary, we're saying these ESG modifying factors, they can and they do influence the economic viability of a mine. And remembering that, that SAMREC is here to give investors the assurance that they're putting their money in companies where there actually are decent quality rocks in the ground. Equally, those investors want to know how the modifying factors could influence that project's viability and to, to know that that company has understood these factors and is managing them well and putting before investors make decisions on where to put their money. The guideline is available on the, the SAM codes website. Um, as a committee, any, you know, there's a number of us who are available to assist uh, if someone is using the guideline and, and finds it's unclear or, or wants some clarification on it. Um, my details as chair of SABES are on the, the SAM codes website as well, uh, if anybody needs to reach out. So yeah, that's really what I, I wanted to, to say today and happy to, to take any of the questions that have come through. Fantastic, Teresa. Thank you very much for that enlightening uh, presentation. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll go through the questions and see if there's any questions. There are none at the moment. Okay. Uh, let's see if there are any. It looks like there's a couple on the chat. Okay, so there's coming, a couple coming through on the chat, not in the Q&A, so that's fine. Um, all right, so. Has um, the so for, sorry, Gary, I'm interrupting you. You carry on. No, no, it's fine. All right, so I've got a couple on the chat. So um, here's one from Alistair McFarlane. Um, has Sam, Sam SG been adopted by the JSC? Yeah, so, okay, so the JSC um, has been very involved and supportive of the Sam SG development. We've had Anneli from the JSC involved with us. She sits on the Sam Code Steering Committee, where I sit as well. Um, in the JSE listing requirements, it makes SAMREC a requirement for, for mining companies and because SAMESC is a guideline under SAMREC, it therefore is also adopted by the, the JSC. To change the JSC listing requirements is a major mission. So we haven't been able to, to change the, the wording of the listing requirements, but because SAMESC is effectively linked to SAMREC, then yes, it, it has been adopted by the JSC. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Here's a question from Raymond Philippa. Is the code only focusing on mineral reserves or also on enabling requirements to make economic extraction feasible, such as water, energy, transportation, infrastructure, etc.? If so, is there standardization and cert certification associated? Well, wow. okay, so I'm hoping that I interpret your question correctly. If not, please just post a follow up question um, and I'll get back to you. So. First of all, just in terms of semantics, SAMESG is a guideline, not a code. That offers us a range of advantages and disadvantages, but ultimately, I'm personally quite happy with SAMESG being a guideline because it allows us the flexibility to update it on a regular basis should we need to. Um, and we want people to, to factor ESG into the details of the, the SAMREC reports that they are already undertaking. We don't want it to be a standalone code on the side. So, so just semantics, um, which I know Tanya would be very clear on if she were on the call. Um, so it, SAMESC asked you to look at all ESG considerations that could be material for the project. And, and here, if I sort of interpret your, your question correctly, Raymond, there is a bit of an overlap, for example, on the infrastructure side. So, 
being able to access water, being able to access energy, your, typically your engineering studies would consider whether there's a, a secure water source available, whether you have access to reliable energy. Samesk looks at water from a different perspective. It's saying, well, is there a river close by that potentially has got people downstream using that water, relying on it for their livelihoods? You need to evaluate how your mine could impact on that water. Um, and in the case where there's an existing mine where a, a water source has already been polluted, uh, there's an liability that attaches to cleaning up that, that water source that SAMES then asks the, the mining company to disclose. So it's in terms of standardization and certification, it's not like your ISO standards where you would get certification. The, the SAMES guideline really is, is about integrating all these ESG considerations into the details of mine planning um, and your that go along with evaluating your mineral reserves and resources so that it's when you're declaring a, a resource or a reserve you know that you can, there actually is a realistic prospect of extracting um, the stuff in the ground that the liabilities can be well managed that the costs associated with managing the risks that have been identified um, through application of SAMESC and your legal processing. Um, that those those liabilities have been costed well in the, the overall financial models for the for the mine. So that you know you've got a project that when we say it's economically viable, we mean that it's viable from an ESG perspective as well as from an engineering um, and a geological perspective. Okay, great. Thank you, Teresa. Um, I've got two questions here from Thomas Rogers. I'm going to ask the one and then the other one. Are JORC and NR43 101 committees planning a similar update of their codes? Does anyone know? Are SAMREC leading this? I love this question. Okay, so Thomas, okay. um, SAMESC is absolutely the first code to have done this. However, um, SAMESC has been invited to present at the Crisco AGM, which is being held in September. Unfortunately, it's virtual. Um, it was meant to be held in Joburg, and we were really looking forward to seeing the various codes here. We've had recent discussions with PERC, which is the, the European um, crowd, and PERC are very interested in SAMESC, and together we are in the process now of, of working with and lobbying the other codes, example, JOC, NI43, um, as well as the smaller codes, um, Brazil, Chile, for example, uh, to get them to support the establishment of an international working group to discuss then from a Crisco perspective um, how ESG considerations can be included in or elaborated on in the Crisco template. So watch the space. It's all quite exciting and it's evolving at the moment. Okay, thank you, Teresa. I see Thomas's question was the second one is the same. So another question here from Raymond Philippa. Does the proposed standard include ESG reporting requirements being set forward by financial standards such as PRI, TCFD, etc.? Okay, so in developing SAMEs, we are co we're cognizant of the fact that there are a number of um, reporting requirements already out there. There are a number sta of standards already out there. You've also got the GRI, you've got the IFC performance standards. And so the objective of SAMESG was to, to emphasize requirements that companies would already be focusing on um, through application of, of these frameworks internationally. Um, the challenge we have at the moment, and we've been doing a review of some of the um, integrated annual reports from a range of, of companies listed on the JSC. Um, the challenge we find is that not all companies have uh, annual CP mineral reserve and resources reports that go into enough detail to, to demonstrate application of SAMES. Um, and they equally don't reflect all of that detail in their accompanying integrated sustainability reports. So there is a lot of work to do in this space to, to actually get companies to, to report on everything that, that SAMESC asks to, to be reported on. But the, the content of what SAMESC is asking you to report on, you would already um, or should already be monitoring and reporting on as, a, as part of your other existing uh, obligations. Okay, great. Thank you, Teresa. Here's a question from Simon Njovu. Um, morning. Uh, Zambia has many potential areas of minerals, both for copper and gold. 
looking at mineral reserves, what's the responsibility of government in terms of mineral policies and reserves? Sorry, I'm not entirely sure I'm the best person <laughs> to answer that question. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to find where that question is on the chat. Here we go. Um, Looking at mineral reserves, what's the responsibility of government? Okay, so uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to, to sort of do a bit of a hospital pass and say that really is a matter for government um, policy making. Uh, from a SAMES perspective, we we, we supporting the, the declaration of, of reserves and resources. We have um, the DMR in South Africa is, is um, invited to participate in the Stanford sometimes they attend sometimes they're unable to make it so so government has been um, included in this process they obviously receive all communications um but yeah i think the i'm, I'm going to leave that question i'm afraid i'm not all right no that's fine on. no that's fine too is that all right another question here for you what are the requirements for one to be a cp in south africa also is it possible for someone without a south african citizenship to become one Okay, the best place is to go to the SAM Codes website, which is um, SAM Codes with an S.co.za. A CP is commodity specific. So, for example, if you are doing um, a competent person's reports in gold, you need to have, I think it's a minimum of five years experience working in that particular commodity, but it's all defined in the SAMREC code. Um, you don't have to be a South African citizen, it's all based on your experience and qualification and registration with an, a recognized uh, professional registration organization. And you can, for example, author a CP report in South Africa if you're your registration lies, for example, in Zambia or another company through, who, through the recognition of um, professional organizations. All right. Thank you, Teresa. Here's, here's um, Alistair McFarlane. It's not really a question from him. It's, it's more, like, more than like a comment, but please feel free to use the comments on it. Um, ESG compliance has become a global imperative with a great deal of focus at a corporate board level. I believe SIMM has a duty to develop an ESG toolkit as guidance at that level. Is there, so, is there any comment there? Yeah, just to say fully support and agree with your comment, Alistair. Um, <coughs> just for info, what we are arranging for later this year, and we may or may not get the sort of board level guys to attend, but through the Geological Society, um, we are hosting an ESG day on the 22nd of September. We're still busy developing that program. In terms of toolkits, I think there's a number of toolkits already. Um, is it possible to integrate as a modifying factor the need to recycle the waste that is modified during the mineral extraction process? Okay, so um, I, that's more on the, the metallurgy line, but I would, I would simply respond by saying if you are recycling and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about um, mineral waste as opposed to things like paper and plastic. Um, but if you are reprocessing or recycling mineral waste, there's obviously a cost attributed to that um, and you're likely to, to generate revenue from it. And so that'll all come into your, your model um, for the mine, your financial model. Um, so I think it's, it's already provided for, I would say. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Um, Raymond's got a follow-up question here from the previous question. He says, thanks, but how can this be converted from a check-the-box to an objective ESG evaluation that can be used by third parties for the project's risk assessment? Raymond, I think we need to have a beer. Um, <laughs> you've hit the nail on the head. At the moment, we find that, that Table 1... Um, is a bit of a checklist and we see that some of the SAMESC requirements may be used as a checklist. The objective of SAMESC is to say, 
you've got your competent person, get hold of the, the ESG specialists, sit down together, understand the risks and understand what they mean for your project. And it's not an easy discussion to have because on the one hand, the CP is going to be pressurized by the board of the company to, to make the, the project as economically viable as possible to attract investment, to deliver the best returns. The ESG guys are saying, yes, but actually you can't force a community to relocate. So until such time as they've moved their houses, you shouldn't be declaring, as, a, as an example, you shouldn't be declaring a mineral reserve in that area um, because the community is still there. And until they've moved, they haven't moved and they might not move. Um, so we really, the SAMESC is trying to get these silos broken, getting people to have a conversation to come up with a more comprehensive input to these CP reports. Um, same as does require you to disclose your risk assessment process. It does ask you to, to describe your ESG risks and how you're managing those. Um, so yeah, we really, we, we, we hopefully as a same as application matures, we will move away from a tick box exercise uh, and into a, to the discussion and debate that we're really looking for. Um, but the, the success of that is going to arise as a result of the, the nature of the people who are applying it and also obviously our ability to sell SAMEs um, to people who are writing CP reports. All right, thank you, Teresa. Um, Thomas says, thank you very much. You answered his question. Um, another comment here from Alistair, the Society of Mining Engineers in the USA has developed an ESG toolkit. Oh, right. Thanks, they, um, they can be on my list to contact, so I will get that from their website. Thank you very much. All right, Jürgen Fisser has a question here. How will the industry equip young professionals to understand all these codes? Okay, so I'm not sure from an SAIMM perspective, but um, Camilla's on the line, and so she can help me remember at some of our future uh, SSC meetings and in discussion with Tanya. Um, I know that there are various young professional training courses that get offered, certainly by the Geological Society and potentially by SAIMM as well. Um, and SAMESC has been invited to present at those. Also, um, in our individual capacities, a number of the SAMESC committee members do presentations at uh, universities, for example. I know my company, um, we both uh do those kind of presentations as well um but if there are particular organizations jürgens that you are aware of that you think we should be talking to um please drop me a mail and we can make a plan to to reach more people all right thank you Teresa. um all right so here's a here's a question um this SA codes website states that a technical specialist must have an applicable academic qualification and a minimum of five years relevant ESG experience. It is further recommended that he or she is also registered with an appropriate professional statutory body or relevant recognized professional organization. The technical specialist must also comply with the provisions of the relevant acts. Persons being called upon to sign as a technical specialist must, within the context of this definition, be clearly satisfied in their own minds that they were able to face their peers and demonstrate competence. This requirement relates to the qualification of the technical specialist. To what extent does the technical ESG specialist need to be independent? Okay, so this is not like um, an environmental impact assessment where there's a legal requirement for, the, for the, the person undertaking the EIA to be independent of the company. Um, what we are looking for here is this person can, and in some cases often better placed to be part of the, 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 the mining company, part of the team. Um, the independence, in a way, it's, that person needs to be objective. They don't have to be independent from the organization for which they're working, but they need to provide objective input on the ESG risks for that project. One of the information sources will be the, the legal permits that have been obtained for the mine, for example, um, which will then raise the, the most material ESG risks. Um, but that person doesn't have to be independent of the company. In some instances where there's a lack of internal resources, um, some of the, 
the EAPS, the Environmental Assessment Practitioners, may be approached to act as the technical specialist, but where there are available suitably skilled internal resources, um, then that's perfectly adequate. There is a um, provision in terms of the SSC disciplinary procedures that if a technical specialist, say an environmental technical specialist, fails to adequately perform their part of the their duties in acting as a technical specialist, there are provisions um, to, to take action against that person if warranted. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Um, there is a follow-up uh, from Simon Ye says, thank you very much. He would like to continue the discussion after the webinar. Can he make contact with you, Teresa? Simon? Yeah, perfect. Can you share my screen again? And my contact details are here. So anyone is more than welcome. My email address is Teresa at ubuna.com and there's my cell phone number with a whole whack of seven. So just make sure you write down all the sevens. But very right. happy to engage with anyone further um, after this call. All right, a um, couple of questions coming through in the Q&A. Um, and you don't mind, we're gonna continue until our hours up, Teresa, Perfect. as long as the questions come, keep on coming. All right, what are the requirements for one to be um, CP in South Africa. Also, is it possible for some? Oh, that one's already been asked. Um, can you comment on how how you assess the risk associated with obtaining obtaining social license to mine from Roger Dixon? Okay, <laughs> thanks for the easy question, Roger. Um, it's social license to operate is a it's a minefield on its own because. A lot of the social risks come from, well, they are, I suppose, the, the hardcore technical social risks, which relate to there's a community nearby, we're having impacts on the community, we could potentially affect them, we need to move them for, you know, to get the mine operated. The social license for, to operate is built up over years and years and years, and it starts from when the first person puts their boots on the ground in the exploration phase. Um, and it's very difficult, as you know, to, to, to pull back where there's a negative perception out there um, relating to a, a company's uh, social license to operate. And it's also very difficult to put a financial value on it. So Sam has asked you to disclose your risks and typically mining companies should be aware of, of the general sentiment um, in relation to their project. Um, and where the tacky is going to hit the, the tar is if a company is trying to get, is actively seeking investors and they have a poor social license to operate, they're not going to get the investment that they, that they want. Um, and that hopefully acts as an impetus for them to, to address that social license. But really, Sam is, um, asks you to assess that in terms of how you assess it. That's another whole uh, <laughs> a whole long discussion. Most companies have a standard risk assessment methodology, which has a greater or lesser ability to, to rate things such as social license to operate. Um, but where you would really see it impacting that, that project is with the ability, as I say, of that, that company to, to access funding, what protesters arrive at the AGM, how many protesters there are outside the gates of the mine. Um, but Sam does ask you to, to consider the, the qualitative impacts of these risks where you can't necessarily quantify a financial, uh, a financial impact. Okay, thank you, Teresa. We've got an interesting question here from Mark Button. He says, in the past, we tended to declare our resources and reserves and then undertook to manage ESG issues as a secondary process. Incorporating ESG into the SAM code seems to move these issues into the main R&R process. Have you or do you expect to experience resistance to this corporation? He makes a comment, I, I'm thinking of some of the behavior of the current US administration and some companies when it comes to ESG issues. Okay, so, um, hi Mark. Uh, nice to, to, to hear from you. Um, okay, so yes, we very much want ESG to to be a core component of the R&R &R process um, because it can influence the economic viability of the mine. <clears throat> and there are, in, in some instances, you can almost draw geographic boundaries around sensitive receptors and say, you know what, that's not part of our, although there may be a resource there, it's not part of our reserves because we're not able to, to mine it. Um, to date, 
there's little evidence that SAMESC has been fully incorporated and complied with in, in the various SAMREC reports. Um, I'm saying this very loosely and very in a, a very generalized because we've had a, a selection of reports that the, the JSC readers panel has given us to, to review. So um, there may be companies that have done us a lot better that we haven't come across yet. So I'm, I'm, I'm being very generalist in that statement. Um, but yes, we, we are expecting there to be resistance, but we hope that over time and through socializing the same as through talking to investors um, just out of interest the investor analyst society of south africa also sits with us on the sand code steering committee and we actively involved with them and trying to, to talk to their members as well so that investors start asking these questions because we know that's really <laughs> where the money lies that's where, where where people suddenly start changing their attitudes so if they can't get investment um, then, then they might take ESG a bit more seriously. So, so we're trying a multi-pronged approach to, to get authors of CP reports um, to, to take this seriously and, and, and their boards, because we know that there's discussions when CP reports get published um, around the, the potential impacts for the company. Um, so we are absolutely hoping that it becomes integrated into it and not as, as the second step. Um, we equally in the, the EIA space hope that people you know, develop their project in conjunction and in parallel with the EIA process and, and that it's iterative. Um, and and the, the r and process with ESG should also be iterative. Uh, it's, it's potentially a, a, an enabler and a value add to the project um, by tackling these issues proactively. Great, thank you, Teresa. Um, Philip asked a question of whether the presentation will be shared with all the delegates. Um, that is normally our, our process. I'm assuming, Teresa, we can share your presentation um, yeah, as well. I'll, yeah, right. I'll send it through to you guys. Yeah, and that's great. And then Camilla from the SRMM will send it through to all the delegates so you'll all get a copy of the presentation. Um, in fact, all of the all these webinars are being recorded and they will be made available as well so people can listen to them in the future. There'll be links on our website to them and all the presentations up to now have also been made available. Um, that that really is all the questions there are no further questions unless something comes to in the next couple of minutes otherwise Teresa, thank you very much for that enlightening presentation and the time that you you took um, out of your day to present to all our delegates we we ended up with around 50 delegates online so thank you to everybody that uh, was online um and there is another webinar tomorrow alvaro rosa from hatch um head of digital We'll be doing a presentation tomorrow as well if anyone's interested. So, Teresa, thank you very much again for your, your enlightening conversation. And we'll hopefully see you on another webinar soon again. And thank you to all our delegates. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And thanks, Gary. Have a good all day. Right. Thank you. Cheerio. Bye. Bye.